Yo, hello there guys, my name is Mikey, I hope you're doing well. Welcome to Let's Read The Wheel of Time, The Eye of the World. This is the first book in the series, we're going to be starting off with chapter one, live over on twitch.tv forward slash Mikey Mega Mega. But before we dive into this book, there are a few quick things to mention. So firstly, I just happen to really like fantasy books and I want to kind of share that with you guys. And this is just to encourage you to try to pick up The Wheel of Time for yourself and give it a read. We're not doing this to act as a replacement for the books or audiobooks nor infringe upon the rights of the original rights holders. So we're just going to read through each chapter as necessary for the sake of discussion as critique under the terms of fair use and that chat section will be at the end of the video and also live during the broadcast. If you prefer to hear this in the form of an mp3 audio file however I'm going to add that into my discord as well as put it in the next patreon packs drop as a free bonus piece. Not actually intended to be selling as a product or anything like that I'll just include it because the patreon lists are a great way for me to to bring up a email list of my friends to share with privately. Links below! So this is the copy that we're going to be reading from. I grabbed a first free book set from Amazon and this paperback edition is published uh, in 2021 by Orbit. Uh, looks like also Tom Doherty Associates Incorporated own other publishing rights to this. Copyright 1990 by Robert Jordan. By the way, also guys, any thoughts and feedback is more than welcome. Um, am I reading it too loud, too quiet, too fast, too slow? Too many voices, not enough voices, and how is my pronunciation of the names and terms? Get in a comment, let me know if you want me to continue doing this in the future. To Harriet, heart of my heart, light of my life, forever. Welcome to the Eye of the World, Book One of the Wheel of Time. And the shadow fell upon the land, and the world was riven stone from stone. The oceans fled, and the mountains were swallowed up, and the nations were scattered to the eight corners of the world. The moon was as blood, and the sun was as ashes. The seas boiled, and the living envied the dead. All was shattered, all but memory lost, and one memory above all others, of him who brought the shadow and the breaking of the world, and him they named Dragon. From the Aleph Nin Tadean Ala Kamora, The Breaking of the World, Author Unknown, The Fourth Age. And it came to pass in those days, as it had come before and would come again, that the dark lay heavy on the land and weighed down the hearts of men, and the green things failed and hope died. And men cried out to the Creator, saying, O oh, light of heavens, light of the world, let the promised one be born of the mountain, according to the prophecies, as he was in ages past and will be in ages to come. Let the prince of the morning sing to the land that green things will grow and the valleys give forth lambs. Let the arm of the lord of the dawn shelter us from the dark and the great sword of injustice defend us. Let the dragon ride again on the winds of time. From the Charal Dranian Te Kalamun, The Cycle of the Dragon, Author Unknown, The Fourth Age. Then, guys, we have a beautiful map if you can see that there look at that i love fantasy books with maps this is already looking fantastic okay and there's another one here guys which i believe is two rivers prologue dragon mount the palace still shook occasionally as the earth rumbled in memory groaned as if it would deny what happened bars of sunlight cast through the rents in walls made motes of dust glitter where they yet hung in the air Scorch marks marred the walls, the floors, the ceilings. Broad black smears crossed the blistered paints and gilt of once bright murals, soot overlaying crumbling friezes of men and animals, which seemed to have attempted to walk before the madness grew quiet. The dead lay everywhere. Men and women and children struck down in attempted flights by the lightnings that had flashed down every corridor, or seized by the fires that had stalked them, or sunken into the stone of the palace, the stones that had flowed and sought, almost alive, before stillness came again. In odd counterpoint, the colourful tapestries and paintings, masterworks all, hung undisturbed, except where bulging walls had pushed them awry. Finely carved furnishings, inlaid with ivory and gold, stood untouched, except where rippling floors had toppled them. The mind-twisting had struck at the core, ignoring peripheral things. 
Luz fed in Telamon wandered the palace, deftly keeping his balance where the earth heaved. Elena, my love, where are you? The edge of his pale grey cloak trailed through the blood as he stepped across the body of a woman, a golden-haired beauty marred by the horror of her last moments. Her still open eyes froze in disbelief. Where are you, my wife? Where is everyone hiding? His eyes caught his own reflection in a mirror hanging askew from a bubbled marble. His clothes had been regal once, in grey and scarlet and gold, now the finely woven cloth, brought by merchants from across the world sea, was torn and dirty, thick with the same dust that covered his hair and skin. For a moment he fingered the symbol on his cloak, a circle half white and half black, the colours separated by a sinuous line. It meant something, that symbol. But the embroidered circle could not hold his attention long. He gazed at his own image as much in wonder, a tall man just into his middle years, handsome once, but now with hair already more white than brown, and a face lined by strain and worry, dark eyes that had seen too much. Luz Ferrin began to chuckle, then threw back his head. His laughter echoed down the lifeless halls. Elena, my love, come to me, my wife. You must see this. Behind him, the air rippled, shimmered, solidified into a man who looked around, his mouth twisting briefly with distaste. Not so tall as Luz Ferrin, he was clothed all in black, save for the snow-white lace at his throat and the silverwork on the turned-down tops of his thigh-high boots. He stepped carefully, handling his cloak fastidiously to avoid brushing the dead. The floor trembled with aftershocks, but his attention was fixed on the man staring into the mirror and laughing. "'Lord of the morning,' he said, "'I have come for you.' The laughter cut off as if it had never been, and Luz Ferrin turned, seeming surprised. "'Ah, a guest! Have you the voice, stranger? It will soon be time for the singing.' and here all are welcome to take part. Elena, my love, we have a guest. Elena, where are you? The black-clad man's eyes widened, darted to the body of the golden-haired woman, then back to Luz Ferrin. Shaitan, take you. Does the taint already have you so far in its grip? That name, Shai... Luz Ferrin shuddered and raised a hand, as though to ward off something. You mustn't say that name. It's dangerous. So you remember that much, at least. Dangerous for you, fool, not for me. What else do you remember? Remember, you light-blinded idiot. I will not let it end with you swaddled in unawareness. Remember. For a moment, Luz Ferrin stared at his raised hand, fascinated by the patterns of grime. Then he wiped his hand on his even dirtier coat and turned his attention back to the other man. Who are you? What do you want? The black-clad man drew himself up arrogantly. Once I was called Ilan Morin Tedronai, but now... <gasps> Betrayer of hope. It was a whisper from Luz Ferrin. Memory stirred, but he turned his head, shying away from it. So you do remember some things. Yes, Betrayer of hope. So men have named me, just as they named you Dragon. But... Unlike you, I embrace the name. They gave me the name to revile me, but I will yet make them kneel and worship it. What will you do with your name? After this day, men will call you Kinslayer. What will you do with that? Luz Ferdin frowned down the ruined hall. Elena should be here to offer a guest welcome, he murmured absently, then raised his voice. Elena, where are you? The floor shook. The golden-haired woman's body shifted as if in answer to his call. His eyes did not see her. Elan Morin grimaced. Look at you, he said scornfully. Once you stood as first among the servants. Once you wore the ring of Tamrilin and sat in the high seat. Once you summoned the nine rods of dominion. Now look at you, a pitiful, shattered wretch. But it is not enough. You humbled me in the Hall of Servants. You defeated me at the gates of Paran Dizen. But I am the greater now. 
I will not let you die without knowing that. And when you die, your last thought will be the full knowledge of your defeat, of how complete and utter it is, if I let you die at all. I cannot imagine what is keeping Elena. She will give me the rough side of her tongue if she thinks I've been hiding a guess from her. I hope you enjoy a conversation, for she surely does. Be forewarned, Eilina will ask you so many questions that you may end up telling her everything you know. Tossing back his cloak, Ilan Morin flexed his hands. A pity for you, he mused, that one of your sisters is not here. I was never very skilled at healing, and I follow a different power now. But even one of them could only give you a few lucid minutes, if you did not destroy her first. What I can do will serve as well for my purposes. His sudden smile was cruel. But I fear Shaitan's healing is different from the sort you know. Be healed, Luz Ferrin. He extended his hands, and the light dimmed as if a shadow had been laid across them. Pain blazed in Luz Ferrin, and he screamed. A scream that came from his depths, a scream he could not stop. Fire seared at his marrow, acid rushed along his veins. He toppled backwards, crashing to the marble floor. His head struck the stone and rebounded. His heart pounded, trying to beat its way out of his chest, and every pulse gushed new flame through him. Helplessly he convulsed, thrashing, his skull a sphere of purest agony on the point of bursting. His hoarse screams reverberated through the palace. Slowly, ever so slowly, the pain receded. The outflowing seemed to take a thousand years, and left him twitching weakly, sucking breath through a raw throat. Another thousand years seemed to pass before he could manage to heave himself over, muscles like jellyfish, and shakily push himself up on his hands and knees. His eyes fell on the golden-haired woman, and the scream that was ripped out of him dwarfed every sound he made before. Tottering, almost falling, he scrabbled brokenly across the floor to her. It took every bit of his strength to pull her up into his arms. His hands shook as he smoothed her hair back from her staring face. Elena! Light, help me! Elena! His body curved around her protectively, his sobs the full-throated cries of a man who had nothing left to live for. Elena! No! No! You can have her back, Kingslayer. The great Lord of the Dark can make her live again, if you will serve him, if you will serve me. Luz Ferrin raised his head. The black-clad man took an involuntary step back from that gaze. Ten years, betrayer, Luz Ferrin said softly, the soft sound of steel being bared. Ten years your foul master has wrecked the world, and now this I will... Ten years, you pitiful fool! This war has not lasted ten years, but since the beginning of time. You and I have fought a thousand battles with the turning of the wheel. A thousand times a thousand, and we will fight until the time dies and the shadow is triumphant. He finished in a shout with a raised fist, and it was Luz Ferrin's turn to pull back, breath catching at the glow of the betrayer's eyes. Carefully, Luz Ferrin laid Elena down fingers gently brushing her hair. Tears blurred his vision as he stood, but his voice was iced iron. For what else you have done, there can be no forgiveness, betrayer. But for Elena's death, I will destroy you beyond anything your master can repair. Prepare to remember, you fool. Remember your futile attack on the great Lord of Dark. Remember his counterstroke. Remember! Even now the hundred companions are tearing the world apart, and every day a hundred men more join them. What hand slew Elena Sunhair, Kinslayer? Not mine, not mine. What hand struck down that very life that bore a drop of your blood? Everyone who loved you, everyone you loved. Not mine, Kinslayer, not mine. Remember and know the price of opposing Shaitan. Sudden sweat made tracks down Louis Ferrin's face through the dirt and the dust. He remembered, a cloudy memory like a dream of a dream, but he knew it true. 
His howl beat at the walls, the howl of a man who had discovered his soul damned by his own hand, and he clawed at his face as if to tear away the sight of what he had done. Everywhere he looked his eyes found the dead. Torn they were, or broken, or burned, or half consumed by stone. Everywhere lay lifeless faces he knew, faces he loved, old servants and friends of his childhood, faithful companions through the long years of battle. And his children, his own sons and daughters, sprawled like broken dolls, play stilled for ever, all slain by his hand. His children's faces accused him, blank eyes asking why, and his tears were no answer. The betrayer's laughter flogged him, drowned out his howls. He could not bear the faces, the pain. He could not bear to remain any longer. Desperately he reached out to the true source, so tainted with Sidin, and he travelled. The land around him was flat and empty. A river flowed nearby, straight and broad, but he could sense there were no people within a hundred leagues. He was alone, as alone as a man could be while still alive. Yet he could not escape the memory. The eyes pursued him through the endless caverns of his mind. He could not hide from them. His children's eyes, Elena's eyes. Tears glistened on his cheeks as he turned his face to the sky. Light, forgive me! He did not believe it could come, forgiveness. Not for what he had done. But he shouted to the sky anyway, begged for what he could not believe he could receive. Light, forgive me! He was still touching Sidin, the male half of the true power that drove the universe, that turned the wheel of time, and he could feel the oily taint fouling its surface, the taint of Shadow's counterstroke, the taint that doomed the world. Because of him, because of his pride, he had delivered the men who could match the Creator, could mend what the Creator had made, and they had broken. In his pride he had believed. He drew on the true source deeply, and still more deeply, like a man dying of thirst. Quickly he had drawn more of the one power than he could channel unaided. His skin felt as if it were aflame. Straining, he forced himself to draw more. Tried to draw it all. Light, forgive me, Elena! The air turned to fire. The fire to light liquefied. The bolt that struck from the heavens would have seared and blinded any eye that glimpsed it, even for an instant. From the heavens it came, blazed through Lewis Ferrin Telamon, bored into the bowels of the earth. Stone turned to vapour at its touch. The earth thrashed and quivered like a living thing in agony. Only a heartbeat did the shining bar exist, connected ground and sky. But even after it vanished, the earth yet heaved like a sea in the storm. Molten rock fountained five hundred feet into the air, and the groaning ground rose, thrusting and burning spray ever upward, ever higher. From north and south, from east and west, the wind howled in, snapping trees like twigs, shrieking and blowing as if to aid the growing mountain ever skyward, ever skyward. At last the wind died, and the earth stilled to trembling mutters. Of Luz Ferin Telamon, no sign remained. Where he had stood, a mountain now rose miles into the sky, molten lava still gushing from its broken peak. A broad, straight river had been pushed into a curve away from the mountain, and there it split to form a long island in its midst. The shadow of the mountain almost reached the island. It lay dark across the land like an ominous hand of prophecy. For a time the dull, protesting rumbles of the earth were the only sound. On the island the air shimmered and coalesced. The black-clad man stood staring at the fiery mountain rising out of the plain, his face twisted in rage and contempt. "'You cannot escape so easily, dragon. It is not done between us. It will not be done until the end of time.' Then he was gone and the mountain and the island stood alone, waiting. And that's the end of the prologue. 
So thank you very much for watching along, guys, and listening in. Uh, that was just for prologue. We're going to dive straight into the next chapter in the following episode. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel to get all of the uploads or that you've clicked on the playlist. I'd really appreciate it. And again, let me know what you think, what needs to be changed and tweaked. And of course, if you're curious on buying yourself a copy of The Wheel of Time, links below. So thank you very much again, guys, and I'll see you for the next one. Take care.